Neurologists aren't perfect. Heck, they call it the practice of medicine for a reason. My name's Aaron Boster. I'm an MS neurologist here in Columbus, Ohio. And in this video, I risk pissing off some of my colleagues. I'm going to share with you my observations over a decade and a half of caring for MS patients, the five most common mistakes that I see neurologists make. Don't turn away because all of that starts right now. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. In this video, I want to share with you the five most common mistakes that I see neurologists make when caring for families impacted by MS. Does that make them bad doctors? No, not at all. These are just things that I wish that they would keep top of mind so that they could have a better therapeutic alliance and do a better job of helping people impacted by MS live their best lives. Get out a pen and paper and let's jump in. Number one, is a failure to adequately describe the natural history of multiple sclerosis. That's a doctor's way of saying, if we don't adequately treat you, what do we expect to have happen? We don't spend enough time, I feel, helping someone understand what is in store if they don't adequately treat their disease. Neurologists are pretty good at sharing the risk benefit of a given medication. If you take this medicine, there's a risk that it could cause X, Y, and Z. And that's very, very important to understand. But I think it's probably more important to understand the risk benefit of that medicine inside the context of the risk of the disease. MS is a nasty, insidious creature. And brain damage accrued today may not affect you terribly much today, but it absolutely will cause deficits down the line 10 to 20 years later. I oftentimes call that the devil's trick. And I wish that neurologists would spend a bit more time helping a family understand that the decisions they make today, the risk benefit that they accept in a drug today is intended to maintain their neurological status and help them preserve the neurological reserve 10, 20, 30 years down the line. It's a major misstep in my mind not to adequately prepare a family to understand why it is so important to treat aggressively up front. Number two is failure to share the MRI images with the patient and family. And this really frustrates me. I've seen many patients in consultation who share with me they've never ever actually seen their MRIs. And that's a massive miss. The MRI is not the end-all be-all, but it is a very, very important picture of structure. And it allows us to literally visualize the brain damage and the spinal cord damage that someone has accrued from MS attacks and MS activity. Not sharing that with the family doesn't allow them to fully appreciate the impact of the disease. Sitting down with them and sharing, for example, the fact that their brain is shrinking too fast and pointing to where you can see that on the MRI, I think, I think is extremely telling. That old adage that a picture is worth a thousand words is probably true. And I think that it is an absolute best practice that every time you have an MRI, your neurologist takes some time and goes over it with you. And I think failure to do that is really missing an opportunity to help educate the patient and family and to get us all aligned about why we're treating this disease. Number three has to do with lack of follow-up after an MS attack. When someone with MS has an MS attack, we can hasten the recovery by giving them steroids. And I think it's incumbent on the neurologist to see that human being a month later in the clinic to ensure that they fully recovered from the attack. Because if they haven't, there's still a window to intervene, whether that be to give more steroids or another therapy. Moreover, if somebody is on an MS medicine and they have an attack on that medicine, that's called a breakthrough attack. And that's evidence that the medicine may not be working. I mean, think about it. If you're taking birth control and you get pregnant, it didn't work. And so if someone's taking a medicine and has an attack, we want to follow up a month later to critically consider whether we need to escalate from that drug to a different one. Not doing that is to miss an opportunity to adequately manage this disease. Real quick before we go on. If you've gotten some value out of this video, do me a solid favor and give it a thumbs up. Also, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Thank you. Number four is to participate in what I call therapeutic inertia. Therapeutic inertia is defined as when you identify a clinical problem and you don't make any changes to correct it. 
And all too often, someone with MS is on a medicine and they're sharing with the doctor, hey, things aren't going well. I'm having increased difficulty with this. I can't do this. I've lost this ability. And the neurologist says, mm-hmm, and they don't change the drug. If we identify that the person is failing the litmus test of life, whatever that may be, it is imperative that we consider an escalation in therapy. And all too often, I feel like neurologists sit back and they make some paternalistic decision that, oh honey, that's not bad enough to merit change. I disagree. The escalation model is a flawed model. I have a lot of videos on this channel that talk about it. So I'll throw a link up here in case you wanted to watch one of those later. But if we have someone on a medicine and we identify that something's not going well, anything's not going well, that is rationale for a discussion and possibly escalating their drug to something that's gonna work better. Come on guys, wake up. And number five is failure to aggressively treat chronic symptoms. Symptoms are things that suck and they can erode the quality of our life. And all too often, I see people in consultation that were placed on an MS medicine, they're getting adequate surveillance to make sure that medicine's working, but their chronic symptoms have been completely ignored. What am I talking about? Well, things like the up there's. People may have untreated depression, untreated fatigue, untreated cog fog, and they're struggling in their personal life and they're struggling at work and the neurologist isn't addressing it. I've got pills for those ills. People can have problems with the down there's, bowel, bladder, and bedroom. They can be incontinent of urine. They can have difficulties achieving orgasm. And yet the neurologist isn't trying to help make things better. If we want to do our very best job as MS neurologists, we have to do two things. We have to slow the disease down, yes. And we also have to improve the quality of someone's life, which we do by treating chronic symptoms. And I feel like all too often that's ignored. It takes a village to help someone live their best life despite having MS. And I want the MS neurologist to be a key village member. We are not perfect. We're flawed humans. I certainly am. And in this video, I wanted to share with you the five most common mistakes that I see neurologists make. If you want to up your game and continue to learn more about MS, click the video that's on your screen. And until my next Monday morning video or my next monthly live stream, or even better yet, the next time I see you at the Boster Center for MS, this is Aaron Boster saying be safe and take care.